All right. Hello, class, and uh, welcome back to lecture three, part A. In this lecture, we're going to utilize some of the perhaps more technical results we got in the previous lecture, lecture two. That is the physical invariance, the invariant of angular momentum. which is a constant, and the uh, invariant of energy, which is also a constant for the restricted two-body problem. That is, we have a planet, which is very large or a large mass, and we have a relatively small spacecraft uh, orbiting that planet. Alternatively, of course, uh, we can uh, have the sun and we can have a planet orbiting the sun. In either case, the mass of the planet or the mass of the spacecraft is assumed to be negligible compared to the mass of the central body. So as I said, in last lecture we talked about these physical invariants, angular momentum and energy. In this lecture we'll mostly be concerned with the scalar values of those quantities, that is the uh, magnitude of, those, of the angular momentum vector, which is not a function of time, so I shouldn't do say that and uh, in that energy. So these are things which, well, you can sort of measure uh, angular momentum and energy. Well, you can't measure them directly, of course, because they don't have that real, you know, physical meaning that uh, you can actually me can't measure energy per se. But uh, you can measure it in terms of, say, R cross V for angular momentum because V and R are things that you can measure. And uh, in the case of energy, we had uh, v squared over 2 minus mu over r. Again, v, that scalar value, being a thing we can measure, and r, again, being a thing we can measure, r being the magnitude of the distance from the central body and v being the magnitude of the velocity at that point. So these are things we can measure. They have sort of the physical interpretation. And now we're going to show that these physical invariants lead naturally to geometric invariants of the orbit. So the orbit is elliptic. It stays elliptic, so it doesn't change into another ellipse over time. It's a single ellipse. And <clears throat> the only motion of the bo uh, uh, in the system is the motion along that elliptical pathway. So in particular, uh, we're going to do this in two dimensions, right? So we're going to consider motion in the orbital plane, so not the orientation of the orbital plane to a great extent, although we will talk about the eccentricity vector, which defines some motion of the orientation of the orbital plane, but we'll mostly sweep that under the rug. Uh, rather, we'll uh, talk about the this ellipse, uh, the two foci, the parameters of the ellipse in two dimensions, so the main parameters are of the ellipse in two dimensions, are the semi-major axis, which is the distance from the center to the uh, periapse and the apoapse, and the eccentricity, which uh, is uh, actually a number between 0 and 1, which measures sort of the distance of the center from the distance from the foci of the ellipse. Right, so those two geometric invariants which define the ellipse, and of course we'll also talk about the motion along that ellipse as well in terms of what's called the true anomaly. So we'll also talk about that. That varies with time, so that's not technically invariant. Right, so these, these are the main geometric invariants of the problem. And so we're going to be talking about how to go back and forth between these geometric invariants and the, uh, the sort of physical invariance of the system, angular momentum and energy. I a highlighter there. <coughs> Along the way, though, uh, we have to, again, right, prove that uh, we are moving along an ellipse. Otherwise, why are we finding elliptic parameters? Uh, and so we have to make a little digression, prove uh, Kepler's first law. Um, so Kepler's first law here. We'll also go at the end and prove Kepler's second and third law as well along the way. But that'll be come towards the end, not in part A. Uh, 
so to prove Kepler's first law, we will uh, take sort of these physical position, velocity, geometric invariance, and uh, derive what's called the polar equation uh, for the distance, which is uh, p over 1 plus e cosine f of t. And that's the, that's the polar uh, parameterization of an ellipse. Um, so that's a goal, and uh, in this part A, we'll get through the derivation of the polar equation. Right. So again, this is a relatively mm, substantive lecture. So there's lots going to be lots of good material here. You'll probably come back to lecture three again and again uh, to pick out those equations that we'll we'll talk about for the uh, the elliptic motion, uh, the invariance of the ellipse, and how they're related to each other, uh, because they're very important uh, a set of equations, and I'll highlight them uh, as we go along. All right, so uh, first of all, <clears throat> the first thing we're going to go over here in part A is the polar equation. Uh, in part B, we'll uh, take the polar equation and do a little bit more deep dive. Uh, we'll talk about, we won't actually get to the semi-major axis in this first part of the lecture. Uh, that will come actually in the second part uh, when we get the semi-major axis. We'll get eccentricity here, but we won't get semi-major axis. Uh, then we'll follow up with the derivation of Kepler's three laws. Now, most of the relationships that we'll talk about uh, apply to the all three types of orbits, uh, the elliptic, the parabolic, which doesn't really exist, there's no such thing as a truly parabolic orbit, and the, uh, the hyperbolic orbit. Um, and I'll try and highlight uh, when, so when these equations apply to each of these cases. Uh, there are certain equations which don't apply to the hyperbolic uh, case, which so you have to be a little bit careful on that, um, but I will highlight those uh, when we go through them. Ultimately, of course, the goal is to convert between uh, those two relatively simple uh, physical invariance, energy and angular momentum, uh, to the orbital elements, uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity. And that'll allow us to do things like uh, prediction. Well, I want to allow us to do prediction in the same way that Kepler wanted to do prediction, actually, that comes in lecture four, unfortunately. Uh, so, but Kepler didn't have a good equation. There was no, Kepler didn't come up with Kepler's equation, right? So, um, so we all, we're only gonna get to a, sort of a partial answer to that question. Uh, so we won't be able to predict precisely position and velocity as a function at a given time, but we can do simple things like, uh, based on initial observations of the geometry of the problem, uh, we can get these, uh, can convert those geometric invariants to the uh, energy and angular momentum, and then we can use those to get things like uh, velocity at a, as a function of position and things like that. All right, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, the goal of this lecture, so I suppose we should get started. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So I think we got to most of there. So in the last lecture, just as a reminder of what we covered in the last lecture, uh, we proved invariance of two important quantities, specifically angular momentum, which is defined as the cross product of R and V, right? So if uh, here's your motion, here's your central body, right? That's the position vector and then the velocity vector is the direction you're going, um, also known as r dot. So that quantity is invariant. Um, and if you take that cross product, that gives you the angular momentum vector, which is a vector which is actually pointed out of the plane, right? So it's perpendicular to the plane. It gives you the orbital plane, right? So everything we're gonna be talking about today is mostly in the orbital plane. Uh, we're not gonna talk about the orientation of that orbital plane in space that comes in a later lecture. Uh, so this will mostly be two dimensional. So everything's gonna be perpendicular to this angular momentum vector. Uh, however, the, uh, the magnitude of that angular momentum vector is very important and we will use that a great deal. Uh, the orientation of the angular momentum vector, uh, not so much. So uh, everything 
dot r and the v's remember are in the orbital plane so everything that we're looking at today is going to be perpendicular to that angular momentum vector uh, we also of course uh, studied this total energy uh, i say energy but total energy combining uh, kinetic energy and potential energy so kinetic energy this is again per unit mass as is the uh, the angular momentum uh, which is uh, one half v squared minus mu over r right. so we have this invariant quantity called energy and again we'll use that to uh, interpret it in terms of a uh, geometric invariant uh, we also talked a little bit about what this means, uh, the total energy, to be positive or negative. Remember, we had those gravity wells, right? So uh, this is the potential energy, and if your total energy is greater than uh, zero, that means that your kinetic energy is large enough to get out of, the, out of this gravity well. What does it mean to be get out of a gravity well? Well, it means that you're no longer orbiting the planet. You're not trapped in that gravity well. So if your total energy is less than zero, you don't have enough kinetic energy to get out of the gravity well, and hence you're in what's called elliptic motion, right? Or, uh, or you're in orbit, right? So planets are in orbit around the sun because they're in the sun's gravity well. Uh, the moon is in the Earth's gravity well. All of those have energies, total energies of less than zero. By contrast, of course, the, uh, the, the, contra the converse is that if your ener total energy is zero, you're not in elliptic orbit, and that uh, we call these hyperbolic orbits because that's the geometry of the of the the flyby or the what what happens. Uh, again, we'll go, we'll go through and prove right that these are in fact elliptic and hyperbolic. We didn't show that in the last lecture. We just showed that you can escape or you cannot escape depending on whether your total energy is less than or greater than zero. Okay. So the question is, how do we get then from uh, energy and angular momentum to Kepler's laws? Right? These invariant quantities, how do we get to the geometric invariance of the problem? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I have a couple notes here. Um, I guess I'll mention that, uh, and as I discussed in last lecture, these two invariants are actually four invariants, four invariants because h is a vector. So there are four invariants of motion. Actually, however, there are uh, five invariants of the ellipse. So there's uh, actually only, there's, uh, there's a and e in the plane, that those are invariant. Uh, but then in three-dimensional space, you have to sort of orient this ellipse in space, in three-dimensional space. And so there's three more that gives you the orientation in three-dimensional space, which we won't talk about yet. Uh, that's right ascension, argument of periapse, and inclination. Uh, those are later. But the point is uh, that you have five invariants, geometric invariants, and so far we've only talked about four physical invariants. So in the next slide, we're going to have to actually create a new invariant. Uh, Specifically, it's called the eccentricity vector, and we'll talk about that in a second, which is not really a physical invariant, although it's measurable, it's, it's derivable from measurements, but we don't usually think about eccentricity vectors in any context other than orbits, whereas angular momentum, of course, and energy, we certainly do. Um, any other comments here I should address? Uh, uh, everything is in per unit mass, so dimensionless in a certain sense. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's, the, uh, th that's uh, all we've got here. Um, we do, I do note that if we are only interested in these two orbital elements, A and E, then actually E and H, the magnitude of H, is enough to get those, those two orbital elements. But in general, it's not enough to define the orbit overall. Um, as we'll see, however, even for, for this, the, these two, we need to go through uh, the eccentricity vector to get where we're going. Right, so what is the eccentricity vector? Well, that is a question that people often pose to me and I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, it's 
interpretable, right? It, it, it makes, I can, I can tell you what it is. I can't tell you why this formula makes sense, however. So this is a formula. Intuitively, I can't really explain that. Uh, we'll derive it in a sense, um, but it has, it, so it, basically it has two interpretations. And so I'll just throw those out right away. Um, so the in eccentricity vector gives us orientation within the planar orbit. Uh, so specifically, the eccentric so there's a, a periapse. There's a closest point in the orbit and a farthest point in the orbit. And the eccentricity vector gives the orientation of that uh, closest point on the orbit. Right. So the eccentricity vector, am I doing hats or lines? Uh, points towards the periapse. Um, it's not the position vector of the periapse, but its, uh, it's orientation is towards the periapse. And what, that's important because in, in, even in two dimensions, we need to have a measurement, a way of getting from position and velocity. We need to have a way of measuring our, or parameterizing our path along the orbit. And so we tend to do that by measuring the angle of our spacecraft. Uh, with this eccentricity vector or with the line heading towards periapse, right? So in, in that interpretation, the eccentricity ve vector gives us a very important piece of information and it allows us to measure that angle uh, given a, given a, a, uh, uh, given a, um, a position vector. Right? Um, but it has another interpretation as well, which is somewhat counterintuitive, which is that the magnitude of this eccentricity vector is the eccentricity, which seems it would, ha it would have nothing to do with a, a vector pointing towards the periapse. And in fact, it's hard to explain why, uh, where that comes from. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so this is a, an orbital element. It's not an orbital element, but it's an invariant, and we'll prove it as an invariant, uh, which gives us really two important pieces of information. It gives us the invariant of eccentricity, and it gives us the invariant of which direction the periapse is pointing in three-dimensional space, as measured from the, the central body. Right. So two pieces of information. I don't know how it was. I can't tell you what the intuition was in deriving it. Um, it was a, a bit of history. It was derived by Hamilton. Uh, what was it? What was his name? Rand Randolph Hamilton, uh, uh, W. R. Hamilton. I, uh, uh, I forget uh, the first and last. Walton, maybe Walton Hamilton. Anyway, he's a very Hamilton. It may seem like a very familiar name to. You. If it is, it's be, it's not an accident. Uh, Hamilton was a great mathematician back in the day, eighteen mid eighteen hundreds, uh, and so you've probably heard of the Hamiltonian, right? Which is uh, which is an operator, which which is a quantity, uh, which uh, many of you are familiar with. Uh, for people in controls, uh, you may have heard of the Cayley Hamilton theorem, which uh, is very useful in say constructing solutions to differential equations, uh, state space solutions, and so forth. So the, he, he's contributed a lot. He also invented quaternions. Uh, if you're a more advanced orbital mechanics person, quaternions are due to Hamilton. Um, so anyway, but he invented the Ham he invented the eccentricity vector. Uh, it wasn't, of course, uh, derived by Newton or anything like that. Uh, of course, uh, Newton didn't express many of these things in terms of vectors, so that's not surprising. Uh, but in any case, this is it. it right? So it's, uh, I mean, I can also interpret it and tell you what these pieces are, right? Uh, so at any point in your orbit, right, uh, overuse that ellipse, so I'll just draw a new one. At any point in the orbit, uh, the Hamiltonian is, so here's your angular momentum vector, which is moving out of the plane. It's the uh, cross product of the velocity, right? Which is, uh, of course, uh, this direction, uh, with the angular momentum vector, right? So if this, uh, the velocity is there, the angular momentum vector is there, then uh, this cross is perpendicular to both of those two. So it's over there somewhere. Um, why that would be important, I can't really tell you. 
Uh, and then subtracted from that, we have a, we just have the, uh, the position vector, a unit version of the position vector. Uh, so it's just the position scaled by the magnitude of the position, and then these mu's cancel out. So it's just, it's just that position vector, uh, the, the unit version of that position vector. So how do you come up with that? I'm not entirely sure. Um, so, oh well, I'll do it. Just, just admit it. Um, but we can prove that it's invariant at least. That's, uh, that's something. Uh, so if we look at it, we just take the, uh, this, this nice formula here. And we differentiate it. It's not too hard to prove, right? Just take the time derivative. Right? Uh, what happens to the time derivative? Well, we apply the chain rule a couple of times. <clears throat> uh, let's apply it first to uh, this term, right? That becomes uh, r double dot uh, cross h plus r dot cross h dot. Uh, fortunately, in the last lecture, you already heard that h dot is zero, and so that term gets scratched out. This term, uh, likewise, uh, it's similar to stuff of the stuff we covered in uh, lecture two, but it's not quite every, anything, not, not quite there. Uh, this is, of course, um, r transpose r dot product there to the one half uh, with r there. And then we apply the chain rule to that. And then we got this part and this part. And the first part is, of course, just r transpose r one half r dot. And then the second part is we bring the one half down, r transpose r, that becomes now negative three halves. Oops, sorry, there's a negative sign there. Uh, and then uh, the derivative of this term, which is uh, two r dot transpose r, right? Just, we can swap them back and forth. So we just put the two there, the twos cancel. And so we get here uh, something like uh, r dot, which is of course v over the magnitude of r plus uh, r dot transpose r divided by the cube of r. Okay. So uh, those are those are the terms. Hey, that one goes right there. That one goes right there. Oh, right. There was a negative sign here. Uh, so then uh, we get uh, the uh, yeah negative one half there. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, so let's see, uh, which one is that negative one half on? It's uh, on this one. So there's a negative sign. So this, uh, that negative sign cancels out, becomes a plus. Uh, this one doesn't have a negative sign, so that keeps the negative sign there. And then uh, this term, which we got right there, just drops down. And so we have one, two, three terms here. Now, um, let's expand these terms one at a time. Um, actually, we're, we're just going to focus on expanding this term here because once we do that, the other bits will cancel out. There's a couple bits of uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it, um, vector um, properties here, specifically the triple cross product. Sounds like a horse race or something like that. Uh, so specifically, uh, we've got here, remember, r double dot cross h. H is itself R cross R dot, so R cross V. And so this term becomes then uh, R cross R cross uh, R dot. And so we've got, uh, uh, we've got, uh, well, sorry. Uh, and then we plugged in, of course, for R double dot, which is just uh, mu over, uh, it, there's a law of universal gravitation, right? So this, this term is R double, no, sorry, r double dot, right, equals um, negative mu r over r cubed, universal gravitation just there. So we've got uh, this triple cross product r cross r cross v. That's v, of course. Now, you may not be aware of all of the uh, unique little product uh, properties of cross products. And you would be forgiven for not being aware of all of them. Uh, this particular one, the triple cross product is, uh, is interesting. Uh, so basically what you remember what you're doing, you're crossing three vectors, right? Uh, 
So here's uh, say B and C, cross B and C, you get something perpendicular to B and C. And then you got another vector, I don't know, floating around here, A. And then uh, when you cross A with the perpendicular to B and C, right, it projects it back down onto the plane uh, defined by B and C. Uh, so that's basically what you're doing. And then the, uh, the coefficients of those two, so it's like these two vectors, it's projecting onto the plane defined by B and C. Uh, so then, of course, we have got to take these, uh, these uh, inner products right there, A and B and A and C. Uh, but, in, right, we can do that here for this specific case, which I think we do on the next slide. Did I miss anything here? Um, yeah, we'll get that later. Uh, so yeah, here's our triple product, right? We apply the triple cross formula here. Uh, this is A dot B, remember, and A dot C. Erase that. Uh, so we can uh, now project back onto the uh, plane defined by these two vectors. And uh, what, does this, uh, what does this tell us? Um, so first of all, we, got, uh, we just uh, move this bit right there and don't do anything to it. Uh, this bit, however, is a little bit more informative, right? Because uh, r dot r is just the magnitude of r squared, right? And so uh, because, remember, we have this cube over here, that square cancels out... Uh, two of those exponents. And so uh, this uh, we get, as a result, uh, this denominator is just r as opposed to r cubed, as we had before. All right, so uh, we've expanded this term out a little bit. And uh, it honestly, it doesn't look a whole lot more friendlier than it did before. But now let's plug it into our expression for e dot. And something uh, remarkable happens. Um, Specifically, when we make that plug right there, that goes to that term and that term, uh, we get this negative term here and a positive term here. Uh, if we look at this, then if you look at it carefully, well, what we notice is that there's a cube here and a cube here, and this is r dot v here and r dot v here, and there's r there. So these two terms are identical in opposite in sign, so they cancel each other out. And of course, these two uh, terms are obviously identical as well and opposite in sign, and so they cancel each other out. Right? So of course, that was the point, is to, to find an invariant, and Hamilton was very, Hamilton was very clever in, in, in figuring out this, uh, this invariant. Um, and so what this tells us is that the formula for, uh, for E uh, doesn't change with time. Let's go back and pull that formula. And I will, uh, let's see, I do that cut and paste thing. Copy to clipboard. And just remind us what the formula for E does. Right. So uh, this doesn't change with time. Even though this bit changes, this bit changes, this bit changes, they all change with time. E itself, as a, as a cumulative uh, value, doesn't change with time. So which means if you can measure R and R at any point in time, and you know the angular I mean, if you can measure V and R at any point in time, you can determine your uh, eccentricity vector. So a single observation of R and V gives you the eccentricity vector, which then you can use for all future time. So the eccentricity vector. And now, as I said, the, uh, there has, the eccentricity vector has two properties, which don't change. One is the direction uh, towards the periapse of the orbit. Uh, and this, true, this holds for hyperbolae as well, right? So if your hyperbola goes like that, right, it still points towards the point of closest approach. Uh, not terribly useful for us right now. Uh, the other, however, property is that if you take its magnitude, you get our first invariant orbital element, which is called eccentricity. Okay. So calculation of eccentricity, uh, a way to do it directly is to actually calculate the eccentricity vector, although that's rarely done, uh, based on R and V. Although if all you have is a single observation of R and B at some random point, then yes, okay, then maybe that's the best way to calculate eccentricity. But if you know the geometric invariance, then it, the, uh, if you know all the, uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but in any case, it is a way of calculating this first invariant orbital element, 
which is eccentricity. Now, I say I call it eccentricity. Does it actually have any relationship to the eccentricity of an ellipse? I mean, obviously, I think it does because I've called it eccentricity, but I haven't proven that yet. And so that's going to be our next challenge. Again, though, right, we have to first uh, define uh, this uh, concept of a true anomaly, so this, this parameterization of the ellipse itself. Uh, so specifically, now that we have this eccentricity vector, e hat, we're going to define what's really our next uh, invariant orbital, uh, not inv it's, not an, it's an orbital element, but it's not invariant, which is a true anomaly, which basically is the angle between the periaps and your current position on the orbit, f of t. And, right, how do you calculate that angle, right? Well, you just use the dot product, right? So the angle, that angle is the dot of R uh, with eccentricity. And so, right, if you know these two vectors, you can calculate the angle between them just using the cosine formula, right? right? A dot B equals A vectors B cosine the angle AB. Right, so we're uh, that, that this is just uh, this is the definition of, of the uh, true anomaly, which we'll be using in, on the next slide. Uh, and from that, we will show that in fact, uh, this this, para this this true anomaly parameterizes an ellipse uh, by deriving the polar equation. So this is the polar equation for ellipse in polar coordinates, right? Where remember in polar coordinates we have. Uh, theta and r, right? So polar coordinates are defined by angle and distance, right? right. And so as opposed to x and y, which are much less convenient for elliptic shaped orbits. Right, so that's, uh, again, I, I, as an, I assert, assert, and we'll actually prove this in, in this part of the lecture. Um, after this, in part b of this lecture, we'll then go on and uh, prove a bunch of other things. Uh, specifically, uh, that the eccentricity, the thing that we stated earlier, that the eccentricity vector all does point towards the, uh, the focus of the orbit, or the, uh, the, the periaps of the orbit. Uh, that its uh, magnitude is, in fact, uh, the eccentricity of that orbit. Um, that uh, you know, some other things for uh, uh, elliptic orbits, E is always between 0 and 1, and for hyperbolic orbits, E is greater than 1. So we'll prove all those things. Most of these things actually we're going to consider in part B. Right. <clears throat> so again, right, uh, to prove these things, we're going to define the motion of the orbit not in time. Time will come in lecture four. Uh, but in terms of this parameter f, right? We, we, again, we, Kepler's three laws never give an explicit parameterization of the orbit as a function of time. That's much harder in lecture four, Kepler's equation. Uh, rather, it gives a parameterization of your position as a function of angle, right? It says angles, equal areas are swept out in equal time, for example. This was uh, Kepler's second law. Uh, the period of the orbit is proportional to the semi-major axis. Okay, that's not relevant here. And that, of course, the, this position vector actually sweeps out an ellipse over time. Those are, those are Kepler's first and second laws. So we have to get rid of time uh, because time just doesn't factor into any of those questions, right? It's, it's a much, more, much harder thing to deal with. And so instead of parameterizing our path along the orbit as a function of time, right? Instead of R of T, uh, we're going to do something much simpler. We're going to look at R as, oops, sorry, I'm getting this off. R as a function of true anomaly, which is, of course, itself a function of time. It's a scalar, right? It's a, you know, and presumably, as a function, as time varies, you can figure out what f is, but that's, uh, again, lecture, lecture four. Uh, so again, uh, we now are defining <clears throat> this second uh, orbital element which is true anomaly. It's not invariant. This is not an invariant orbital anomaly. It does change with time. Uh, as the angle between 
the position vector and the, uh, the, the eccentricity vector. Yeah, that's the definition using the law of cosines. <clears throat> so obviously this, uh, this, uh, this angle varies between 0 and 2 pi. It's measurable, right? You can actually, uh, if you're on the, 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 the surface of this, this angle of this planet, uh, you can measure this angle by just observing how much uh, the, uh, the, position, the, the position of the planet sweeps out as a function of time. You don't need to know the distance in order to find it. Um, <clears throat> however, its rate of change is not constant. Uh, areas, uh, rate of change of areas is constant. And actually, there was some, some de uh, debate. Uh, Newton, when he was a student, right, very young Newton, seems to have not had access to the primary sources, Kepler's primary sources, but rather poor restatements of them or something like that. And so I think actually is uh, Newton's early work, he actually thought that Kepler was saying that ang rate of change of angle was a function of time. That's, that's what I read at least. Uh, so that, but, but again, that's not true, right? The angle, rate of change of angle is not, uh, not constant. So, uh, I mean, it's clearly not true, right? I mean, uh, the, the angle moves much faster at periapse than it does at apoapse, right? So, you know, stu Ke Newton, as a student, like all students, make, makes mistakes. It's, it's hardly his fault, though, because he just didn't have a good library to, to look up Kepler. There's no internet. Uh, and besides which, have you, if you've read Kepler's, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, get, get past all the, uh, the music of the sphere stuff. Uh, in any case, uh, at some point in the future, lecture four will convert between f and t. But at this point, we're only interested in finding the position vector as a function of time. Uh, sorry, as a function of uh, true anomaly. So how this distance changes as you get as this angle changes. Right? Polar coordinates again uh, are of theta, where theta is that angle. All right. Uh, so how are we going to get that? Uh, it's actually not that hard, right? So if we actually, I mean, remember, so if I just uh, click this angle definition, I right, recall the definition, right? So if we want to figure out uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, this, this, this quantity, right? We're interested in that number. Uh, so, Let's let's calculate it, right? So we, we want to want to know this uh, this quantity as a function of uh, uh, as of true anomaly. So let's like figure out what it is. So we know what e is, and so all we do is just uh, take r dot it dot that r dot that, right? And figure out what's going on, right? So uh, first bit here r dot uh, r dot r dot h, right? R dot that bit. Um, well, sorry, there's another property, a uh, geometric property of, uh, of the cross product, which is that it uh, sort of commutes with the dot product. Um, so uh, A dot B cross C is equal to uh, A cross B dot C. All right, another property, uh, useful property of the cross product and dot product, um, which allows us to move this r dot, uh, or, or stop crossing r dot with h, instead cross r dot with r. Uh, so when we get r cross with r dot, well, what is that? That's r cross v, which is by itself angular momentum. And so now we have angular momentum dotted with angular momentum, which is of course just equal to the magnitude of angular momentum squared. So that's convenient. We got rid of the r dots. And that's where we're trying to get. We're trying to find things which don't vary except as a function of f. <clears throat> so right, this whole term, r, when we get r dot e, this whole term becomes invariant. Right, so that's convenient. And now we'll look at the, uh, the second bit, right, which is uh, uh, r dot r or r with the unit vector, which is position. Remember, this is a normalized version, a version of position. Uh, so r dot r, well, that's even easier to deal with, right? Uh, r dot r, sorry, not wrong dot, uh, r dot r. Well, that's just 
r squared, right? The magnitude squared. And uh, so what we've got is magnitude squared divided by the magnitude. And so uh, we just get that this is the magnitude of r. So when we've taken r dot e, what we've gotten is that it's this invariant term h minus mu times uh, r, the scalar version of r, right? And so now we just uh, move uh, this to the right-hand side and uh, plug in for this now nice expression for r dot e, and we get that's equal to r e cosine f of t. So we have an expression now in terms of, well, there's R here, there's R here, and H here, and E and F there. Right. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's uh, work with that a little bit. Uh, so, right, here we go. Plugged in that expression. Uh, just what I said, we have this expression here. And now what we're going to do is combine the terms which multiply r. So we're specifically, we're going to move this r over to the left-hand side uh, and isolate it. And all the expressions which multiply r, right, mu comes out because they multiply both. And then the other term is uh, 1, uh, which is just this coefficient, plus e cosine f, which is this part. So this bit goes down here, and this bit goes over there. And so now we have a function of r, or an expression for r, uh, solely in terms of f, right? Magnitude <clears throat> solely in terms of true anomaly. So, uh, of course, we don't have that quite yet. We now need to divide by this term right here. So that, that drops to the denominator. And we're going to drop this term over to the denominator just to, in order to isolate r. So this is r here. So now we have an expression for r of t uh, as a function of h, that's the magnitude squared, divided by mu, and then there's this little expression here, 1 plus e cosine f. And this, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is the polar equation. Very important expression, very useful. That's why it gets a color box. So that's a polar equation. So what this allows us to do is uh, have an expression uh, for r radius as a function of angle theta in polar coordinates, right? So as angle sweeps out, uh, the radius changes according to uh, 1 plus e cosine f. And we can uh, make this a little bit simpler. Actually, we'll do that in the next slide by making... Uh, this h squared over mu, a parameter. And it's just p over 1 plus e cosine f of t. And this, uh, of course, you may ask, uh, why is this an ellipse? Um, well, you just unfortunately have to take my word for it because uh, it is. <laughs> I mean, Basically, remember what an ellipse is. Oh, well, let's see if I can remember what an ellipse is. It's like x squared plus y squared equals a constant over, uh, what is this, a and b. I think that's like it. Uh, so that's that's the parameterization of, a, of an ellipse in rectilinear coordinates. Uh, and then you write, you can plug in r equals um, uh, uh, x squared plus y squared, square root, and, uh, or no, wait, we want to plug in the x equals uh, r cosine theta, and y equals r sine theta uh, into this expression. You should get, uh, you should get the polar equation somehow. Um, again, it's like a little bit complicated, so I'm not going to do it, but, uh, but there it is. Um, and of course, uh, I guess for hyperbola, there's a negative sign here or something like that. But in any case, this is the polar form of an ellipse, or actually any conic section, technically, right? This is not restricted to ellipse. This is any conic section. And in fact, uh, depending on the parameter e, right, uh, you get uh, one of these. So if e is less than 1, for example, uh, the, the important part is that if e is less than 1, uh, this denominator will never be 0, regardless of what f does. And so you get a nice ellipse because uh, the distance never goes to infinity. 
uh, when is e is precisely equal to one uh, at f equals uh, pi or negative pi, uh, the radius actually goes off to infinity because the denominator becomes zero. And when e is greater than zero, we get a hyperbola uh, where the uh, radius goes off to infinity at some finite value of f, right? And that's the defining feature of a hyperbola. Um, so, but regardless, uh, so what, what have we done here? We've taken uh, the, a new invariant, which is this eccentricity vector, right? E. We've, we've measured, we've take, defined an orbital element, which is f, which is the angle of the position vector with respect to that. Uh, we calculated a, uh, an expression, well, basically we were looking for an expression for f, uh, but actually in, in the end we found an expression for r in terms of f, right? So we found an expression for the magnitude of the position vector as a function of f, and that uh, that expression was the polar equation one plus e cosine f, which proves right that the motion, the path that the orbiting uh, spacecraft or whatever planet takes, uh, defines an ellipse. So essentially, at this point, we've been able to prove Kepler's first law, and actually an extension of that to parabolic and hyperbolic orbits as well based on uh, Newton's uh, laws of universal gravitation and motion uh, by in, taking a very circuitous path where we defined uh, the constant of angular momentum and then we defined the constant of eccentricity. Uh, but in, in the end, we got where we needed to go. So that's, uh, that's the proof. That's the end of uh, this lecture, uh, this part of this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll take this uh, polar equation and milk it for all it's worth. Uh, so introducing the semi-major axis and talking about the interpretation of this ellipse in various ways, um, interpreting uh, periaps, apoapse, semi-major axis, semi-lattice lattice rectum, semi-minor axis, and all the rest uh, in both the cases of hyperbolae, ellipses, and parabolae. Uh, but again, I don't want to get ahead of myself because that is in fact the topic of part B. So at this point, I'll take a break and uh, come back next time.